good morning, a special good morning to all of our listeners and viewers on the various channels which transmit Parliament's proceedings in the population of, to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to this, our 23rd meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration. Today's meeting is a follow-up hearing on the responses provided pursuant to the committee's second report on an inquiry into the effectiveness of the state's intervention directed at socially displaced persons. Members of the public are invited to submit their comments during the proceedings through any of the social media platforms available uh, on, on the Parliament's website. This, of course, hearing, as I said, is a follow-up inquiry. We did in, uh, pursue a couple of more detailed inquiries prior, I think almost a year ago. So the, the reason for the, this particular inquiry is to determine where exactly are we with respect to the implementation of the recommendations which were made following uh, the evidence that we took from the stakeholders about a year ago. At this point, I, will, I would like to ask the members uh, who are here from the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services to briefly introduce themselves. Thank you and good morning, Chair and members. I'm Jacinta Bailey Sobers, one of the permanent secretaries in the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Good morning. I am Natasha Barrow. I'm one of the other permanent secretaries in the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services. Thank you. Good morning, Chair members. I am Vijay Gangapasa, Chief Technical Officer Acton. Good morning, Lorraine Rezorel, Executive Director, Social Displacement Unit. Good morning, Chair and members. I am Patricia DeLeon Henry. I am the Director of the National Social Development Program. Yes. Thank you very much, representatives of the Ministry of Social Welfare. Uh, I will ask members of the committee to introduce themselves, and I will take the liberty to introduce one member who uh, viewers would not have been familiar with on this committee. He is my colleague, Senator Torrell Shrikisun, who has taken a keen interest in the work of this committee, and he is attending the committee's meeting this morning as a guest and uh, as someone with an interest in the subject under inquiry. So I will ask for in introductions again, starting with my right, Senator Shrikisun, you can introduce yourself again. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Good morning, all. Torel Shriki soon, guest member for, for today. Brigadier General Ansel Antoine, member. Christine Nualo Hussain, member, and good morning and welcome. Good morning, all. My name is Khadija Amin. I'm an opposition senator, member of the committee. Yes. And, and good morning. I am the Chair, Independent Senator Dineshwar Mahabir. At this point, I would like to remind our stakeholders of the six, six objectives of our initial inquiry. First objective, to determine the prevalence of cases of social displacement in Trinidad and Tobago. Two, to understand the line ministry's plans and strategies for addressing this social issue. Three, to examine the systems and procedures in place for the effective management and monitoring of the various state-sponsored centers involved in housing and or rehabilitating the socially displaced. Four, to evaluate the procedure used to assess socially displaced persons and monitor their condition after social and medical interventions are executed. Five, to determine the effectiveness of the multi-sectoral efforts and rehabilitation services targeted towards the socially displaced. And six, to determine the status of the review of the Socially Displaced Persons Act of 2000. 
these objectives are very com comprehensive. I think basically the committee wanted to find out everything about what is happening at the level of the state with respect to treating and dealing with the socially displaced in Trinidad and Tobago. I therefore, at this point, will ask the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Social Development and Family Services to offer her brief opening remarks before we proceed with the follow-up inquiry. Uh, Ms. Sobers. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, for inviting me. The Ministry of Social Development and Family Services welcomes, of course, the opportunity to share insight into the responses to the reduction of street dwelling in Trinidad and Tobago. The Ministry continues, of course, to work steadfastly and collaboratively to provide an appropriate and effective national strategy to treat holistically with the socially displaced and re eradicate street dwelling. We recognize, however, that among the stakeholder group, efforts have been made to address the problem guided by a collaborative and in integrated approach, but the issue continues to be a challenge. As you are aware, Chair, the government has approved a four-level continuum of care program which will facilitate the removal of street dwellers, the assessment, rehabilitation, and transition into society. And we would have provided the information in our response on this. The continuum, of course, focuses on research, engagement, temporary care, primary care, advanced care, and monitoring and evaluation. Draft standards of care, a revised draft policy document for the Socially Displaced Persons Act of 2000 have been reviewed in the context of the Street Dwellers Working Committee's report, and it is envisaged that this will play a key role in charting the way forward. Efforts have also been made to establish pertinent baseline data as recommended by the committee since we met and with the development of a multi-year research agenda. A national street count was conducted in November 2017, and another survey was completed in April 2018. Not as comprehensive, only dealing with CSDP, that's the center um, at Besson Street, Piccadilly Street, and New Horizons. The purpose of the survey was primarily to allow for the categorization of the socially displaced persons in care, and we expect to do court shamrock in San Fernando at the end of May. We expect also to commence the client demographic baseline data and needs assessment by June this year, which will allow the ministry to have a detailed understanding of the population, inclusive of the causes as well as their needs. The ministry has also been engaging its key stakeholders on working through the various strategies proposed in all of the outcome documents, including the GSC reports. And in this regard, I am, permit me to say that the ministry has already taken steps to allow for the establishment of a street dwellers coordinated and monitoring committee, um, which will perhaps begin its work between this month and next month. The establishment of the committee, of course, is viewed as a key success factor in addressing the problem. And at this point, I wish to assure the committee that the ministry remains committed to the implementation of the recommendations of both the, this committee as well as those of, of the street dwelling working committee, street dwellers working committee, sorry. And significant strides have been made in the area of collaboration, especially with the Ministry of Health. So we have already met to chart the way forward with respect to the future of the New Horizons facility for persons who are mentally challenged and socially displaced in Peparo, and we are planning site visits scheduled for this week. Um, and I now turn over to P.S. Barrow, who will just give some insight into the infrastructural types of um, advances we've made since we met with you. Very well, P.S. Barrow. Good morning again. And thank you, Chair, for affording me the opportunity to update the committee on where we've reached with regards to the infrastructural arrangements being made to date. As you would have been aware, the steps were being made to establish a street dwellers assessment center as recommended by the street dwellers working committee. And identification of a location for the establishment of these centers has been a challenge as it, has, as it pertains to suitability and ease of access to our clients. 
To date, the ministry has identified at least two appropriate locations as a short-term remedy within the Port of Spain South environment. We have approached the Property and Real Estate Division of the Ministry of Public Administration and Communication to secure the property and plan to approach Cabinet this month with design plans. The Ministry also remains in close communication with the San Fernando City Corporation as it relates to expanding the existing facilities at Court Shamrock, which presently accommodates 26 persons. The electrical upgrade and pump installation at CSDP, which became necessary due to OSH requirements and is expected to be completed this month, and renovations at the Center of Hope and New Horizons are also required due to OSHA and public health compliance is expected to commence this, fis this fiscal. I take this opportunity to assure the national community of the intention of the Ministry to continue to engage the relevant stakeholders in the implementation of the necessary measures and to ensure, to ensure significant impact on, us, on this phenomenon. We are happy here this morning and thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Barrow. Uh, as is traditional, I will start with a couple of simple questions before committee members move on to their own particular concerns. During our initial inquiry, the matter of simple statistics arose, and it was indicated in your response that you were going to deal with this in very short order. Is it that you now have up-to-date statistics on the number of the socially displaced persons in Trinidad and Tobago? Thank you, Chair, again. Um, as indicated, we would have done a count, a street count in November. So we do have statistics with respect to the end of November which would have given us a national total of 414 persons, um, 27 in Arima, 60 in San Fernando, 177 in Port of Spain. Of course, there were other areas where we, um, which we addressed, um, but those are the main areas I'm giving figures for the total being, as I said, 414 right. persons. So you have figures as of as November. The end of 20. November 2017, yeah. and we are due to... Uh, another street count this year. Okay, is it, is it that you are planning two street counts for the year? How, what, what's the number that you're planning to keep your database up to date? We usually do one One for, for the year. year. One okay, for year. right. Out of the 400 plus that you are indicating as uh, existing in 2017, could you indicate how many of those were women? Um, yes, I believe we have that statistic. I raise this because issues arose with respect to how we were going to treat with uh, women who were socially displaced. In total, we had six persons, I'm seeing here, who were female. Okay. Uh, and th that is of November of 17. Yes. Okay. Very well. The, the second broad issue I wanted to raise with you, Madam Permanent Secretary, is with respect to the Socially Displaced Persons Act of 2000. Mm. Yes. That act is not yet proclaimed from my understanding. Is it, has it been proclaimed? No. It has not. Okay. Could you again remind us what are the challenges and what the ministry has done so far with respect to satisfying certain requirements which will allow for a, a proclamation of this particular act? And there are a number of issues with regard to the Socially Displaced Persons Act. Um, the act was actually reviewed by the Street Dwellers Working Committee, and a number of recommendations were made in terms of its amendment. The primary one being that the whole issue of this ministry treating with the removal of persons from the street should be removed. Um, so that it will remain the remit of the Ministry of Health. Um, that act also treats with this, the staff for the unit and also a socially displaced persons board, street dwellers board. And what we have done is actually the committee that I spoke to in my opening address, we have gone to cabinet, or we are going to cabinet to set up that committee so that they could do some of the work that the board would have done if we had established the board through the act. Um, we also had some recommendations in terms of the whole continuum of care 
um, that has to be addressed in the revision to the Act. At this point, we have also revised the policy because in order to have an act passed, you usually have to have a policy that goes with the act. And so we have revised the policy and at, that, and at this point, we have our legal person reviewing the policy before it is actually forwarded to the Ministry of the Attorney General on Legal Affairs. Um, we also have to meet with the Ministry of Health and our other stakeholders to review all the changes that were um, recommended by the Street Dwellers Working Committee before we send the policy, finalize the policy, and send it off to the Ministry of the Attorney General on Legal Affairs. So we are still at a I would think at a place where we are not yet ready to proclaim because we have these different actions okay. to, to and take. So, and Madam Permanent Secretary, this is now the issue I have. There is also the Mental Health Act, which is the primary responsibility of the Ministry of Health. But the Mental Health Act also affects you, your ministry discharging its responsibility with respect to mentally challenged, socially displaced persons. We, we will have... So we, we recommended that uh, there be a review of the Mental Health Act, which is not within your purview. That's within the Ministry of Health, but it affects the work that you do. If the Socially Displaced Persons Act affects the work you do directly. If the recommendations are still in transit, as it were, it's not as if there is any closure. My, my question to you is, do you think there is need, a need for one coordinating body to coordinate with the various agencies, the Attorney General's Office, the Ministry of Health, your ministry, so that we could uh, navigate our way through the Socially Displaced Persons Act and the Mental Health Act? Is it that it is because of the absence of one centralized uh, agency or unit in the government apparatus that, we, that these particular changes to the, to the legislation are not uh, really being pursued with the timeliness that I think they ought to be pursued? What's your view on that? Uh, Chair, I think the Ministry of Social Development has, uh, and Family Services has that rule right now through the Social Displacement Unit, that coordinating um, responsibility. Um, in terms of the challenge, probably Mrs. Bar Mrs. Burrell, who works directly as the person in the unit, could give us some insight as to what some of the challenges may have been. Okay, before I ask Ms. Burrell to come in, could you advise the committee on the, the, the membership of the social development unit? I need to get it clear on, on my mind. And what really the powers are with respect to their authority to liaise with all other ministries to ensure uh, that the various stakeholders in the state apparatus can come together to settle on particular matters so we can move uh, quickly we can move speedily. The socially displaced unit, I need to understand mm -hmm. its particular structure and from where does it derive its powers to perform the coordinating role that I think is very necessary. Um, Chair, the unit actually was, is part of the act. However, the act wasn't proclaimed, but we still set up the unit and the unit really over the years have been considered by the other ministries as the coordinating agency. Excellent and point. They have we understand the Catch-22 situation. Yeah. So there is an act. It's not yet proclaimed. The act recommended a socially displaced unit. De facto, the socially displaced unit is in existence. Is it that although the act has not been proclaimed, this particular unit, as you are saying, does in, in fact, although not in law, it in fact has the authority to perform the coordinating role? It does have the authority. Very well. And, Thank you. Um, they have been working with all the agencies, and they do, in fact, cooperate with the unit. Yeah. I, I, again, committee members, I do need to follow up this before I raise some issues so that we could ask Ms. Borrell to give us a little insight into the work you have been doing so far at the SDU, and then I go on to the committees. Members, yes. Thank you. The... The unit essentially coordinates with the service providers in terms of providing the interventions for the clients. And that is something that uh, it's, 
It has, it, it really works in terms of uh, networking. As to, there's a situation and we reach out to the various agencies in terms of having the interventions. What uh, has been, uh, uh, the unit has been in the past secretariat to the social displacement board. And at the board level is where, where you really have the opportunity for more uh, action at a higher level. And uh, in terms of the- Clarification, mm -hmm. how long have you been in existence and how long have you been functioning as a unit? The unit was um, established 3rd of August, 1999. Okay, so have a long experience. Yes. And therefore there really should not be a problem with coordination. Well, there really shouldn't be a problem in coordination, but what, is, what has happened? Because the, you need coordination at a higher level. Because when you have the service providers meeting, you find that you have more uh, response to crisis as compared to having your system be able to respond in a consistent manner. Um, we see uh, at the unit that with the... Um, establishment of an interministerial committee that is being proposed that, that will allow that kind of uh, um, networking at a higher level that will allow for policies, processes, and procedures to put in place so that these things are effected at a higher level and approved so that you don't have to um, more likely than not depend on uh, interventions as things happen, you have, a you have a process, you have a procedure, everybody knows what their responsibilities and authorities are and they can act on it. And if there is a problem, there are, again, the processes to have the problems addressed if things don't happen as they should. Thank you. And Ms. N uh, MP Niwalu Hussein who is now invited to continue the discussion. I have a number of questions, but the first one I'd like to ask, how many persons have been relocated since um, November of 2017, when you've had your um, headcount. Relocated off the streets? That would not be a number that I would have uh, offhand. One, two, how many persons that would have been, um, had intervention for? Interventions via the unit, which would be, we would have numbers via the unit which would be what our field officer assigned to the unit would be able, we'd be able to provide that. But we must remember that persons also access the services at CSDP voluntarily. So we would have to compile both what are the admission figures at CSDP but and what the unit Ms. would have done. Um, Res Borrell, I would think that, you know, if you have a unit, um, you would be very excited about the achievements of the unit, and therefore when you come to the a committee, you would be able to say, hey, since we last met with you in um, 2017, we have had so many um, interventions, we have so many persons re relocated off of the streets, and therefore um, you would have been able to, to speak of the success of the, of the unit. You speak of the, um, an interministerial unit now to be able to deal with it at a, at a head level. Is there an interagency unit which was at, um, operational at the point of uh, November 2017? The question on the interagency unit, I would like to defer to have that answered by um, the Permanent Secretary, please. <laughs> we Permanent don't. Secretary, is there a no, unit? we don't have an interagency unit. The, you, the social displacement unit acts as the unit that collaborates with all the other agencies. And that agency now, which is the SDU, um, is now forming as IMU, which is the interministerial unit, which is um, Ms. Res Boris just indicated will be established or is being established. No, this is the interministry. This is the coordinated and monitoring committee that would be established to oversee the recommendations, the implementation of the recommendations of the street dwellers working committee. Therefore, the implementation unit, the arm, which was the IAU, was in fact disbanded, and now we are we're creating another unit to do the implementation. Is that what you're saying? No, we are not creating a unit. We are just establishing a committee, an overarching committee with, rec with representatives from various sectors, the ministries, the private sector, and the NGO sector. Is there any unit that is operational at this point that 
implements the policy or the existing policy of the ministry regarding socially displaced units uh, persons. It's socially displaced unit, social displacement unit, of which Ms. Borrell is the head. Okay, so you're the implementation arm, and you're the implementation arm. Cannot indicate to the committee this morning how many persons have been relocated off the street since November 2017, and how many persons have had intervention. Um, and just to ask the NSDP, how many um, persons have actually walked in off of the street to the NSDP offices, and which office um, was that intervention? Uh, that, did that inter intervention take place? Socially displaced persons uh, would come off of the street, however, they would go to the social displacement unit, which is located on St. Vincent Street. If after, um, if there is any need after for referral to the National Social Development Program, then that is done. But they are the, the unit that they would um, interact with. with. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a socially displaced person, and I live in Toko. I have to come to Port of Spain to get intervention? May I? It's not NSDP. It is the CSDP, Center for Socially Displaced Persons, at, uh, um, that is located in the Riverside car park. That would be the facility where persons do walk in. And the numbers that we have for since January in terms of persons at the total number is, uh, to March 28 to 2017, we have 68 persons. New Horizons, five. Prepare Empowerment, five. CSDP, 29. In Port of Spain, CSDP in San Fernando, 39. So those are persons case. that you have um, located at all those um, um, intervention centers, right? Those would have been persons who would have been for the period 2017, March to 2018, March. And what At were the numbers day. prior to, the, to, to that date? Do prior to that date, I don't have that information here with me, but today there are 115 persons at CSTP in uh, Port of Spain. There are 26, as mentioned earlier by PS, in San Fernando, 21 at New Horizon, 17 at our elderly facility in Arima, and 17 at Papa Empowerment Center. I, I have a follow-up to my colleague's question, and that is, uh, there was uh, a recommendation that some of the rehabilitated uh, socially displaced persons be employed as life coaches to assist other socially displaced persons to integrate. Were you able to secure any success at all in getting some of the rehabilitated uh, socially displaced persons to act as these life coaches? Any, uh, any success in this area? At the facility at Paparo, the, um, the, there is one staff member who would have come through the program specifically at Paparo, who is currently employed there. And uh, so that you have had one, uh, do you have a target, of course, to maybe at the end of the year to increase that number from one to any other, uh, other amount. I, I, I'm really curious as to how well that particular initiative is working. And if it is working well, whether you plan to expand the number of life coaches drawn from the community itself. Well, it would be, because it is a state-run facility, we would have to go through the, the process of establishing the position of life coach. The staff who's currently working, he's, he's working as, uh, um, the, he's on the, uh, the agricultural program. And from time to time, he is part of the sessions where we're, they would work with the clients, where he does, where he sits in, and he is for closer to our mentor. So the process of establishing uh, the position of life coach is something that has to be done for the, and the PIPARO and any other facilities we may have. So it would require some more work than we've had the opportunity to do. Follow up before I ask uh, Senator, uh, MP Hussein to continue. You had indicated in your submission that there was a need for 15 social workers at, as a minimum, and you did have an optimum number, I think double that amount. How many social workers do you have at present employed in the ministry to deal specifically with the socially displaced person? We 
We have one person right now in the social displacement unit who's a social worker, but um, we're working towards uh, interviews. Okay, so, so Madam persons. Permanent Secretary, we are well below the minimum of 15 uh, that, uh, that was recommended. Yes, we are at this point in time, right. but as I indicated, by probably the next two months, we should have some more in the unit. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Chair, if I make it, I just make one correction, sure. please. Um, earlier, in terms of the question on the number of females, yes, um, the information I gave was only for Shaguanas, but in terms of the total of the 414, 22 persons are female. Thank you very much for the correction, Madam P. Sorry, P.S. Barrow, sorry, had indicated that um, the key stakeholders were going to be, have been um, engaged and so forth, and the committee is due to be established sometime um, between May and June. What is the name of that committee? Uh, that committee is the Coordinating and Monitoring Committee for the, for the Socially Displaced Persons. And you spoke about um, categorizations of um, socially displaced persons. Um, how many categories have been established thus far? Ms. Rez Borrell? Categories are the elderly, mentally ill, substance abusers, comorbidity, and the strictly homeless. Have you encountered within the last two and a half years an increase in persons who have become homeless because of the fact that they've lost um, their jobs? The CSDP's files does not indicate that, that is the case in terms of our last uh, review, which would have been done uh, over February, March. That is not being indicated. Um, but before a client goes to um, CSDP, doesn't the client come to, you, to the ministry first? Or are there clients who would um, access the ministry before being sent to CSDP? Clients can access CSDP voluntarily and also via the unit. OK, so for the persons who may have come to you, have you identified anyone who have become homeless as a result of losing their homes because of unemployment? Our files doesn't indicate that either, the social displacement unit. Social displacement unit would refer, most cases get referred to the center for socially displaced persons. So there, in whatever we would have seen at the unit would be inclusive of what would be at CSDP. Can NSDP tell me what role you play in this home? whole um, SDU? Member, I have been invited to participate in this um, committee because I would have previously been at the project implementation unit uh, dealing with the infrastructural issues with respect to the assessment centers for socially displaced persons. Thank you very much, Madam, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, these faces are becoming so familiar now. Um, Chairman, I want to ask Chairman P.S. Barrow spoke about the draft standards of care, um, the revised policy document, and I remember the last time you were here, um, we spoke about it as well. Um, but in your information to us, you indicated that the timeline for this was April of 2018. You did mention it again, and you did indicate that you are still in the process of working. So I wanted to ask if you had the opportunity. You, I know you spoke of the Street Dwellers Working Committee's report and the Cabinet Minutes and so on. Um, it, have, have you reached to the stage of, of reaching meeting with the Attorney General's office. Has the legal office of the Ministry of Social Development met with the office of the Attorney General, and what was the result of that meeting? 
Um, and clearly, we would have passed the April 2018 deadline that you would have had. So I want to ask, what is your new timeline regarding the implementation of the standards of care revised policy document that you spoke about? So we do have a draft standards, standards of care policy document. And um, as I mentioned before, we have revised the policy document that goes with the um, bill so that we can move towards proclamation, but we have not met with our key stakeholders with respect to the revised document because it's with our legal officer reviewing it right now. Do you have a timeline to say that by this date we want to meet with the Attorney General's office by this date and, you know, the steps, the steps in the process and the dates by which you aim to achieve them? We don't have a date as yet, but we're trusting that we will be able to move forward with getting it to the Attorney General before the end of the fiscal. Chairman, I want to suggest here that there are steps required to reach certain, um, certain objectives. And it is my belief that for prudent management of the process and not to allow it to become unnecessarily delayed. Dates should be decided for each of, of the steps, each of the objectives in this process, so that before the end of the year, the PS and the others involved in the process will be able to tell if they are on track to being on time. Because I know there was a date before, and I really would not like another committee to come here and have to be having the same discussion with a new date. So I want to ask through you, uh, Mr. Chair, if the ministry could consider making such a timetable and sharing that with us. So it would help them, yes, but it would also inform the committee as to when we can reasonably expect um, this document to become closer to an act. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I, before I ask, uh, uh, P.S. P.S. Uh, 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 Sobers to respond. I understand that there are matters outside your remit. Those are matters over which you have no control with respect to a timeline. But then there are certain issues which your unit can handle. So I, may I recommend that you 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 look at what it is that fall within strictly within your purview and provide a timeline. And that which does not fall within your, your remit, you provide for us an indication as when you think in order for you to discharge your responsibility well, it will be reasonable for us to expect a completion. But before you do that, I want to raise an issue on something that I think is within your control. There was said to be some public-private partnerships to employ persons a, who were socially displaced. I have noticed a, in some supermarkets, for example, that I see persons who are differently able to be being employed. Uh, was your unit able to secure any employment with the private sector? So we focusing on the timelines, but were you able to secure any employment, any agreements with the private sector so that you have uh, some kind of arrangement where the private sector will offer employment to your rehabilitated individuals? I'm not aware of a structured arrangement, but of course I would ask Ms. Rez Borrell, probably she would have some more information. With respect to the timelines, uh, may I recommend that you itemize the various issues which are within your control and you, you provide for us a timeline. Uh, the issues which are not within your control and an expectation of when you would like to see it done. For example, uh, the recruitment of the social workers is not within your control. Some other agency has to recruit that. But uh, I, would, I would like, if you could indicate to the committee when you would like to get your 15 members, uh, given your own understanding of the time it takes in the public service to recruit such individuals. So you look at some of those practical things and give us the, an indication of when. Uh, because I myself was very, very surprised that you only had one social worker and you did not have the full, the, the, the minimum that you thought your ministry needed. 
So I, you, I think you understand exactly the, 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 the decomposition of what's within your control and what's outside your control with respect to implementing certain measures within, a, say, an, another a year, of, a particularly by 2019, end of 19, where you'd like to be. So uh, I, I, another question, I mean, Senator, I mean? Yeah. Um, Mr. Um, Chairman, um, I, I'm just reminded that in our last discussion, one of the weaknesses that the ministry identified for itself in the implementation of several key projects was um, that it did not meet milestones as a result of weak project management. And I think it is becoming more apparent as we discuss some more of your plans um, that, you know, as you go along. I wanted to mention that, but also in the submissions, the ministry mentioned some challenges um, with regards to the recruitment and the retention of the required competencies. I just want to extend a little bit on what the chairman asked earlier. Um, you spoke about the challenges, but I wanted to get from you what sort of steps you had were able to take to improve um, on the recruitment, but basically to re, I mean, to deal with your shortage of, of staff, at least the ones within your control, um, as well as um, you know what what the ministry would have done to ensure efficient and effective. Um, Retention of staff. Huh? If I may, um, right now the ministry has been pursuing aggressively its recruitment um, of its contract positions, which we have control over. Right? And it is expected that with, at least within these three months here, well, up, up to the end of June, that we would have completed um, the exercise with regards to filling the vacancies that we have within the ministry on contract. The interviews for the positions of social worker has already been scheduled, and we expect that to be completed by the end of June. Application, will those be contract workers? They will. Very well. And is it that uh, because they are contract workers, you can expedite the recruitment we process? We can do the recruitment as opposed to us um, having to go through service oh, commissions. Oh, okay. And could you positions. give us a timeline then if all goes well, when you can get the your number? Is it the, the number 15 or some well, other it number? Would, it would be dependent on, it's, it's more than 15. We are right. looking at across the ministry, not okay. just the social displacement unit. Um, and uh, we are hoping to fill all of the positions, but it would be dependent yeah. on the, num the persons who would have applied and whether or not the time frame for bringing them on board would be on what notice they may have to give okay. uh, where well. they might be. Just a quick question, a yeah. yeah. follow-up on that. Yeah. And, and that is that you're looking to bring on persons on board. Do you have the requisite budget um, to bring on those persons? Do you have um, in, in, in a, on your hand at this moment to see that you can bring on these persons without Funds having to Funds were allocated back. in our budget for all our contract positions. That in the last, during the current fiscal year? Okay, and, and could you indicate to us, I don't have the estimates before me, how, how, how many persons did you request and, and what the allocation was so that I would be satisfied that you, you're not facing a budgetary constraint? I will be happy to provide that information. Very well, thank you very much. Sure. I am concerned. We are here in the ministry speaking of staff shortages. We are hearing of challenges with recruiting and having and, and dealing with the staff, the deficiencies of staff. And on the same fiscal year, there are a number of persons who have whose contracts were either terminated or not renewed within the same ministry. And in some areas, units that were responsible for research, for example, to inform the ministry so that they can make informed policy recommendations that would then become law. Those units have been, so in some cases, disbanded, in some cases, operating with very skeletal staff. So when the ministry, the ministry is grappling to make, um, to make do with the expertise that they have, on the other hand, I mean, you could dress it up in different ways, but when people's contracts are not renewed, they are effectively fired. Okay, very well. Could I pose a pointed question then to both permanent secretaries? 
uh, based upon the inquiry at hand, which is socially displaced persons, is it that apart from the, what I've identified as a deficiency in, in social workers, do you have a shortage of any other type of staff which is adversely affecting your ability to discharge your functions, really socially displaced persons? Apart from social workers, is there any other type of person professional that, that you need in order to ensure that your duties with respect to the socially displaced persons are, are discharged? Uh, Chair, it's primarily social workers. Um, we also have some administrative persons and we also had some field officers. Those are the persons who would have gone out onto the street to do moral suasion with the persons to get them into centers. So generally, those are the persons in the unit and those are the persons we are working on to bring on board as contract workers. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask MP Ansel Antoine to come in at this point? Yes, good morning once again. I am a bit not clear on your establishment of your assessment centers. I'm getting two different responses from the ministry. Uh, you said cabinet agreed to take ownership of the lands located at the corner of South Key and Piggly Streets for the establishment of an assessment center. That area is south of your center for socially displaced persons at the car park, the old car park. And then you said that in your summation, you mentioned the preliminary, preliminary assessment. Assessments were conducted at the Spree Simon building and former site of the Bessel Street police station. And this is north of the displacement center. Uh, are you acquiring both properties or just one property? So the location behind CSDP, mm. that plot of land, um, when we look at, we're still trying to acquire um, that or that fit to be vested under the Ministry of Social De De um, Development and Family Services. We have been liaising with both Ministry of Agriculture, Property and Real Estate, HDC, with regards to having that vested with us. However, um, in the interim or in the short term, we did start looking at other locations that we would be able to provide the services of an assessment center um, in a shorter period of time um, that it would take for us to construct um, the assessment center and the transitional housing at behind CSDP. One of the areas that we went and we did site visits on was the Best on Street Police Station, the old Best on Street Police Station, as well as by the Spree Simon, um, one of the buildings which is next to the soup kitchen that is there. Um, and uh, we did determine that the Best on Street Police Station, um, that site was the most suitable location, and as well as its, its um, proximity to the CSDP as well as the location of it would have been the most ideal location. So we are pursuing um, the establishing the uh, assessment center there, which would also be for transitional housing also. So what note is going to come in for the, for the property at the bottom of South Key and Piccadilly Street? No, the one, for, the one for Besson Street. So the South Key is no longer? It is, but it's, it's in the long term. So long term. So you have yeah. a short term and a long term plan. Yeah. So best of street is is long term. Could you give me a short time? Term. Short, short term. term. So in the short short term, uh, could you give me a time frame? Well, the note for cabinet is going to go um, by the end of this month, um, and we are still leasing. With, we are we're kind of constrained by property and real estate and the acquisition of the building itself. And and was this catered for in the PSIP? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So and. Was this would have been the original project that would have started off with when we were looking at Queen Street, which was the building that was found to be structurally unsound by the Ministry of Works and Transport, and we had to abandon that. So there was no need for any increases in terms of the midterm review no. for this, these properties? No. Okay. Very well. Okay. Senator Sri Kisoon? Thank you, Chair. Good morning, all. Um, I would just like to, to reflect on some of the questions that Member Hussein was asking earlier. And we heard from, uh, on th 
by your introduction that there were just about 415 there about displaced persons in Trinidad at the last time it was measured. Do you have the, the number for the year before, 2016? You can just give me the total, the total would be fine. Could you just give me one total, the total, just as you presented the total for 2017? The total for 2017 was 414. And the year before? The year before, the total was 317, but we need to note that some areas, the 2017 count, included some areas that was not included in the 2016. Okay, so essentially over the year, year on year, you would have had a hundred, an, an, about 100 per persons increase in terms of being socially displaced. What appears to be an increase, because some areas were not counted, that's right. not, uh, we, we can't make that sure. assumption. So it's, but just okay. generally, there was a, a noted increase of 100. We're not saying that it was specific, but it's general. Well, if the area was not counted, so, for example, if there were five people in Barataria, and Barataria in 2017, and Barataria was not counted in 2016, we can't call it an increase because we would not have had the data for what's in Barataria in 2016. So, in the end, um, street counts, this is the nature of street counts. It is very difficult to count entire areas and be clear that you have specifics. So what happens is areas are counted and you have uh, the best that you have at that given point in time. That's a point in time survey. So um, what we have uh, sought to do is to have uh, increased uh, assistance through the corporations so that we can have uh, consistently and as many areas counted as possible using the resources of the various corporations. Because again, the regional corporations, often they have a better idea as to where the population might be in any given area on any given night. And in terms of population, 414 would be those who are on the streets. What we also include is persons who are in the centers for socially displaced persons to add that figure to have, to be able to speak to persons who are socially displaced street dwellers in Trinidad and Tobago. So 414 represents persons who were found on a specific night on the streets. And uh, to have a comprehensive, to say street dwellers, you would add who would have been at the centers on that specific night. Chair, Chair if I may, um, just doing the maths from the area that was done in 2016 and comparing it to the area that was done in 2017. In 2016, it was 317. When you look at the areas that was counted, the similar areas in 2017, it was 269 and 69. So there was an increase, there was a decrease, sorry, over the period. So that helps me. So, but then the question, therefore, is how many, how many of those, of the decrease, or how many that you, was act, uh, the ministry or the unit who actually intervened in getting them off the street? For that decrease, can you account for, via your actions, for, via your actions, can you account for this decrease, or is it just because? That would be, um, the answer to that is simply is not certain whether it's the intervention of the ministry or any of the NGOs that was dealing with the um, population. Right, my point here is, or oh, should I ask one more, I should ask one question. Do you have a goal as to how quickly or how many of the socially displaced people on the streets you would like to, to see addressed or removed off the streets in a particular year? Do you have a goal or an agenda? Usually what we look at is a percentage in terms of the number that is on the streets at, from our street count. So the percentage realistically given the capacity of our centers, we usually look at trying to have 20% uh, persons engaged on any, for any given um, year or so to have engaged 20% at least. So am I to assume that of the number that you would have counted that your goal for the year would be to reduce it by roughly 20%? 
for the areas, for the various areas that we would have um, engaged. Yes, and specifically, given resources, we look at Port of Spain and San Fernando. Given that those are the two facilities that have the first step, the centers, shelters that persons can go to. We essentially have two challenges. One, areas with, with street dwellers that were not accounted for in your areas that you did not check, and then 80%, roughly 80% of people remain unhelped because of inadequate resources. We would have, uh, and as evidence of by persons on the streets, we do have a significant amount of persons who are not accessing help. Now, the amount of persons that you get into your facility is not necessarily, uh, is not actual representation of how many persons you have engaged and offered help. Because the persons, as far as the unit is concerned, what we do is offer the help. They can say to us, no, they are not interested. Mm -hmm. So in terms of persons that you can take through the process, that's the 20% that we look at, not how many persons may have been engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just allow me to make one comment. One and comment and then MP Nuala Hussein yeah. has to, has, so, she has a burning follow-up to your comment. I think yeah. we should recommend some metrics for, for, for this unit yeah. so as to measure performance and, and, and to determine. I, I wanted to yes, ask if there are existing like international standards right. that could be recommended. Right. I know the ideal is 100%, but there might be some Okay, so Senator Sri Kisun and Senator Amin, both of them would like to get some, some metrics, some... some some objective, measurable uh, pointers. Could you indicate what those might be for us? Mr. Chairman. Could we, could we give them an opportunity to oh. respond? While Senator Amin, uh, Senator Amin, could you hold? Because uh, Senator uh, MP Hussein does have uh, some burning follow-ups to the points raised by Senator Sri Kisun. Could you clarify sure, again the, the, the question? Because I think we're oh. talking about metrics. Yes, um, uh, the uh, follow-up from Senator Shriki soon with regards to what your target is in terms of the percentage of people you remove from the street. Thus far, your target really is limited by your resources. And I know that's not an ideal situation. Ideally, we'd like to see 100% of persons removed. But uh, what I am asking, if, uh, are there any international standards that, you, um, that exist in terms of percentages, in terms of number of people that you'd want to engage as well as remove? Um, and do those things guide, or can those things guide you um, in terms of improving your target? I know right now you are very restricted yet to your resources. Right. So, so we have gotten the drift. Stuff. I would like the, the, the representatives to respond. Thank you very much. Sure, Chair. I just need to make one point, and I would ask Ms. Resborough to speak um, to the other issues and to indicate that the removal of persons from the street, if you would recall, that's an issue that we are addressing with Ministry of Health. So that in terms of targets, and given that the authority for us to remove is not in our remit, it would be difficult for us to create targets unless we do that collaboratively with the Ministry of Health. So that is not so much our resources that limits us, but the authority. It's not in our remit to remove persons. Okay, but, but you do have the socially displaced unit, the SDU. You indicated that it was the coordinating arm According to the 99, according to the Act, it does have de facto powers. It has some powers. It has an ability to liaise with the police, the Ministry of Health, and all the other agencies. So since this unit is in existence, I would like to find out what prevents the unit from working with these other agencies of the state to achieve the objectives. Right, and, and Senator Shriki soon wants to come, come yes, in at this point. Just for one point, and I, I understand your position with respect to, being, to having people removed or um, persons removed, but we could just use a metric of how many people you've actually engaged and not necessarily go, for, go further down in terms of remove, but just to tell us how many people you would have engaged so as to de determine the effectiveness of the unit. The, that 
they are, they, in terms of engagement, those figures can be provided because, yes, we do maintain um, our stats in terms of the engagement of persons that is maintained in the unit. Um, in, uh, but that, we don't have that here today, so that can be provided. The question in terms of the coordination, the, what we usually encounter is uh, the explanations from our partners and our networks. Again, it's their resource constraints. So our, we do have the major challenge of the removal of the mentally ill. And that uh, when we speak with the Ministry of Health uh, in terms of the mental health officers and their services, uh, that they do have the issue of resource constraints also. So in terms of removal, when we speak of removal, and this is involuntary removal, it will be the Ministry of, the health, Ministry of Health or the police, and the police would indicate that to be able to engage some persons, they do require the support of the Ministry of Health also. So there's, from our partners, there's also the reports of resource constraints to do what they need to do in terms of effecting involuntary removal. Thank you very much. MP Niwal Hussein has to come in. She, I think she is, is intrigued by your response. Very much intrigued, because as far as I'm aware, the IAU unit, that's the IAU, they were responsible for which means interagency unit. That unit was responsible for the coordination of which health must have been must be involved and the police, because no person can be removed off of the street unless it's voluntary. The the ministry has chosen to disband this unit, and therefore, as such, it has become the unit has become important. You have not been able to do the work that you are able to do. If you're in fact stating that there has been um, a decrease, then therefore the IA unit was in, in um, operation at that time. And therefore the credit must go to the unit because they were the implementation arm. The unit that, that is currently being um, managed in the ministry is a, is a policy making unit. A policy making unit does not Implement. Okay. And could, therefore, could I if get it is, yeah. and therefore, if it is your state stating that the, that the, 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 you need to depend on your partners, which is health, to, to remove, then you are in fact saying that you're making a policy for another ministry, and that cannot be. Okay. And so I'm asking the question, following up from um, Senator, who did the counting before, or was the counting always um, provided the, the figures provided by the cooperation, and if this is in fact so, then you're depending on data from another institution, which cannot be. You must have your own data collection um, processes. And uh, if this is in fact so, when was this arrangement made with the corporations? And also, what areas were not counted in 2016? Well, let us get it pointed. There is an SDU, socially displaced unit. MP is saying that there is another unit that was in charge of implementation. I need to get it clear in my own mind. Is the SDU challenged with respect to implementing? At this point, the SDU is responsible for both implementation and policy. And it's Challenge. challenged, as you would, as we would have said, there is one social worker. So we are working towards ensuring that it's properly resourced. So that, of course, would be our challenge. But at, at all points, that unit worked collaboratively with the other agencies because in terms of the authority, legislative authority, it's really the Mental Health Act that we depended on to get the mentally ill which are the persons who are mostly the socially displaced persons off of the street? So you have PS and SDU with one social worker, or with access to one social worker, and that you have to implement policy. Is it that you absolutely need a better staff complement before you're able to execute? Is it now based upon the, 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 the recruitment process that you have ongoing, uh, that once it is finalized, the SDU will then be adequately staff resourced to discharge its function. 
they will be adequately staff resourced and at this point when they do not have their full complement, they work collaboratively with their partners, which are the NGOs and CBOs and the other ministries. But the, the agency that MP Niwalu spoke about, is it the IAU? The IAU, uh, was that disbanded? We no longer have that unit. In okay. and, and how many persons, and I need to get it clear in my own mind, what type of persons were employed in that unit? What was the professional class? Is it uh, social workers? Is it uh, psychologists? Who exactly were the persons employed in the IAU? Uh, that unit, there was a head and manager, and they would have had some social workers, I believe, or field officers, persons who will go on the street and speak with and encourage the persons to come off the street. Okay, so so that was really the, the, the implementation arm. The, the, that was the arm that went out on the streets, it went out and it spoke to the persons. It, it had a police officer, social worker, and individuals who are Okura with this problem and who would, who would do a number of things, one of which is to bring them to the centers, one of which provide counseling, one of which maybe refer them to detox centers. Yes, I need, I need clarity. If, if I may. But the IAU did, right? The interagency unit was, um, uh, was intended to bring the collaboration and coordination that was re required to look specifically at persons being removed off the streets. The interagency unit, well, the recommendation was that there would be police officers, mental health officers, and uh, social workers. The interagency unit was identified to be working within the social displacement unit. The interagency unit effectively was not that. The interagency unit were officers employed by police officers, employed by the Ministry of, at the time, People and Social Development. There was a mental health officer who, again, was engaged by the Ministry briefly, I believe, to perform the function of mental health officer. And there were social workers. The engagement of persons via the interagency unit was a, um, a police officer. The system for removal via police officer is for a person to be charged with an offense and be brought before the court. No person who was removed under the interagency unit was brought before a court. No person who was removed via the interagency unit with the assistance of a mental health officer was brought to St. Anne's, which is where they should be brought to. That was not done. So in effect, the interagency unit, while it did have, to some extent, the presence of these various officers, still the authority to do what they were supposed to do was not legally vested in these persons. So in uh, essence, we had a unit, the ministry had a unit that would have been effecting voluntary removal and relocation to a facility. In the end, uh, um, to review, ideally that's, that system cannot work. It will not stand scrutiny because a mental health officer, if someone is removed by a mental health officer, they must be taken to St. Anne's. If you take them anywhere else, that would be contrary to law. Well, I, I, I need to get something again clear in my own mind. You get a report, your ministry gets a report that there are a number of persons who are living in a particular square. And you get a report that they have been there for a while. How soon can we, the society, expect an officer of the SDU or an employee of the Ministry of Social Services to visit the place where these individuals are residing, to offer the necessary guidance, counseling, and help. So I give you a report today that I know that there are a number of persons who are sleeping in a particular area. 
when can I expect a visit from the SDU or any other agency of your, of your ministry to pay a visit and to do the necessary evaluations? Our field officer visits upon reception of the report. So the field officer is assigned to visit. Um, Mr. Reyes Borrell, could you um, identify to me how many persons are employed in your unit currently? Currently, in it, we have a business operations coordinator, we have a field officer, and we have social work supervisor, who is a social worker. Myself, the executive director, I am a trained social worker. So you have four persons? Currently, four persons in the unit. And what is the ideal complement? Do you have vacancies and positions not filled? Uh, we don't have the information on the approved structure at this point, but we could make always, that available. Yeah. The approved you could, structure. You can always send it to us. But I wanted. But are there, in fact, um, positions in that unit that are not filled? And are those amongst the positions you intend to recruit people for? Yes. Contract positions. Yes. And Senator Shriki soon does have a follow-up. Thank you, Chair. To Ms. Borrell. With respect to the four persons employed at your unit, can you advise how many of them are currently engaged in engaging the socially displaced on the streets? The field officer has responsibility for the engagement. That is the field officer's specific responsibility. If for some reason this field officer is not available, it is done by the senior social worker. Essentially, your answer is one. Wow. One with a one backup with the responsibility yes. and yes. Thank you. I need to get clarification again on the, the duties of this one or two officers. They, I give a call, I say I think there are persons who are living there and they need help. Or they may have approached me and they would say, can you provide help for us? So I call your office. Your officer, you said, will visit maybe within a reasonable period of time, a three day period. Let us say, at, within the week, an officer may visit. The officer visit. On that visit, what does the officer visit alone? Does the officer visit with any assistant? Does the officer visit with, uh, with a police officer? Does he visit uh, with an intention to providing any kind of care, immediate assistance? Or does the officer visit just simply to take a report? That would depend on the nature of the report. The officer would visit uh, with, um, is supported by staff that we have at, the, at New Horizons. So there is a vehicle and a psychiatric nurse attached to New Horizons so that the officer would visit in conjunction. Depending on the nature of the report, it, we would determine what kind of support the officer would need to do. At times, the officer may visit on her own, especially if it's port of Spain and in various areas that she knows. I'm not from the New Horizons. Could you, I, you know, indicate what it is? It's the facility that is a care facility in located in Peparo. Okay. You said um, the area that she knows. Does that mean if she's unfamiliar with an area that there's no visit? She, she would go alone in the areas of Port of Spain because we do have reports, Charlotte Street, Frederick Street, those streets. She's likely to go alone, leave the office and walk down. Um, just to ask, what time of the day um, would a, a count be done on your um, street dwellers? Street counts are done between the hours of 10 in the night to 5 o'clock in the morning. It usually starts... At, it may start later in Port of Spain because the clients take longer to bed down. And, but in the more uh, areas such as Arima, Sandy Grandi, we would start at 10. So it's between 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. Are you aware that, um, that some street dwellers um, may not be there at night? Or there may be street dwellers who are there in the, not at night and the day. There, there are different counts for street dwellers. There. And, and how, how do you, how, how does the ministry, how are they able to identify um, whether the same person, um, that the same person is not being counted twice or they're not being counted at all um, with your time frame for counting? 
Well, let me indicate for point in time service, best practice, it is done at night. The ministry did do a comparative street count day and uh, night in 20, 2016. 2016 to compare the figures uh, in terms of numbers. The numbers in the day was significantly less than numbers in the night. The count in the day is compounded by the fact that people are moving. You are more likely to have difficulty in identifying who is the person living on the streets. So we have looked at that aspect and done a comparison, but to indicate that point in time in the night is best practice internationally. Thank you very much, Ms. Burrell. I want to shift the dialogue now a little bit away from your ministry and towards the NGOs which work in conjunction with your ministry. The, there are some functions which are best done by the ministry within the ministry, and then there are some functions which are best done by the non-government organizations. We were advised that there was a committee that was established to coordinate the work of the NGOs as it relates to the socially displaced. What is the status of this committee? Uh, Chair, I'm not aware of that committee um, that was set up to coordinate the... Okay, okay. I, I, I read that in one of the submissions, so I... Okay. Uh, well, there is a follow-up from MP Ansel. Uh, you said in your response, in terms of reference and draft cabinet note for the establishment of the Street Dwellers Coordinating and Monitoring Committee, has already been prepared. The time frame for the establishment of this committee is May 2018. Yes, and that's the coordinating and monitoring committee that would be established between this month and, and next month, um, which will be overseeing the implementation of the recommendations of the Street Dwellers Working Committee. That is their remit. What will be the terms of reference of this committee? Because this committee is, is anticipated that this committee would comprise officials from ministries, NGOs, the private sector, etc. I, and I, I would assume from the Port of Spain Corporation as well. So, what's the terms of reference? Uh, the terms of reference of that committee includes examining the report of the Street Dwellers Working Committee on the outcome documents of this committee and ensuring that they are implemented. They are also going to ensure that an implementation schedule is um, developed to ensure that we have time frames for the implementation of the various recommendations. They will be working with ministries and agencies to develop their specific work plans for the recommendations and, of course, identifying barriers to implementation and bottlenecks and treating with those um, and also monitoring the review and reporting to the cabinet. Yeah, some implementation part of this committee, because I'm I'm getting the impression that we are we are creating a very large bureaucratic uh, base situation with committees and so forth, but very little on implementation, and we are dealing with street dwellers, we are doing socially displaced people. We should have a different dynamic in terms of a pyramid with a smaller top and a wider base. Right, I'm getting the, the it, it's a reverse pyramid. A lot of bureaucracy on top, very little implementation below. Um, member, this committee is not intended to be bureaucratic. It's a coordinating committee. It will just be overseeing the implementation of the recommendations. And of course, as I indicated, they will be working with the different ministries and agencies to make sure that they have their work plans and resources uh, actually put towards the implementation of the various recommendations. So I think this committee has been a missing link whenever we have plans like this, and this is probably why some of it in the past have, have sort of fallen by the wayside, because we didn't have this monitoring mechanism in place. I would implement the recommendations, the findings of this committee, so that it would get down to the people who need it most, the street dwellers, and the socially displaced people. All the key stakeholders, the Ministry of Health has a role, the Ministry of Rural 
um, local government, rural development and local government, and also the Ministry of Health, the key players. I, again, I raise the issue with the NGOs, but it involves much more than the NGOs, of course, as MP and Ansel and Fine indicated. What I'd like to know is this. NGOs receive subventions from your ministry, and every subvention ought to be monitored and evaluated. Who does the monitoring and the evaluation of the expenditures of the NGO to determine that the NGOs so discharged are doing what they are required to do uh, after they have received funds from you? Chair, we have a mechanism in place. We have an NGO unit in the ministry that is responsible for overseeing all the subventions that we give to various organizations. That unit um, monitors the expenditure on a monthly basis and on a quarterly basis. And we also have um, an m and &E division, which we are currently trying to fully resource. Um, that unit, over some years, did not have the full staff, and we now have a director, and we are looking to provide some additional support for the director so that that unit, for example, at this point in time, um, is doing an evaluation of the CSDP, the Center for Socially Displaced Persons, and out of that report, of course, would come some of the issues that we may have to address, what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, and how we can improve what they're doing there. Thank you. And have any NGOs been removed from your list on, a, on account of misuse of funds? No, we don't have any NGOs being removed. In fact, um, we... This is because we usually have a quarterly investigation um, by our audit unit also for all the NGOs that we give subventions to to ensure that if they probably not doing their records in the way that they should, that it could be corrected before we have any issues that you speak to. Any NGOs received any assistance with respect to internal audit and external audit of their accounts from the ministry? All the NGOs are required to submit um, annual audited financial statements. Uh, sometimes it's a difficulty because there is a cost and the ministry has to work with them to get it done in various arrangements. Okay, because we did indicate that the NGOs themselves should seek some assistance to get uh, some, some cost reductions from the private sector. Do you know if any of them were successful with respect to moral suasions on the accounting auditing firms so that they could get some kind of financial reprieve as their, their, uh, their accounts are audited? Because I'd imagine without audited accounts, they would have a challenge to, to, to actually source funds. Yes, at least one NGO I'm aware of was able to do that kind of a negotiation so that they are always um, up to date with their audited financial statement. Okay, very well. So it, the recommendation remains in force that NGOs should, as far as it is practicable, seek to get some kind of assistance from the private sector with respect to auditing their accounts so that they will then be in compliance of your financial rules and their flow of funds shall not be stymied. Any questions from the committee? Oh, you have one, right? Yes. Um, Yes, as you have indicated that the, um, the NGO unit um, would do the monitoring and evaluation. Um, you have indicated throughout the, uh, the committee session this morning that persons um, can go to any one of these um, homes, whether it's New Horizon or the um, CSDP. And um, I was wondering, how do you, or how is the ministry able to monitor and evaluate if someone goes there directly? Um, and how many socially displaced persons would have been readmitted? And, and how are you able to determine whether the persons that you are um, monitoring um, is in fact um, the same person that came in um, two weeks or two months ago or whatever it is? Um, and therefore, you might be in fact attending to the same person um, and, and counting it more than once. If you don't have um, a, a direct involvement in the very first place, which is a, 
just ask him. I just answer one aspect of the question, and that is to make the distinction between the monitoring and evaluation of the NGOs and the monitoring and evaluation that will take place with the clients. So we do have the NGO unit and the m &E unit that will deal with the strategic type assessments of the organizations to determine whether they're meeting their objectives. And then we have the other assessment that will be done by the SDU in terms of the clients and what's happening with those clients as they go into the facilities. So that will be addressed by Ms. Laura, Ms. Rez Borrell. Okay, and, and Ms. Rez Borrell, if you can identify, what are the objectives that you have set for the um, various homes, please? The, for clarity earlier on, for, clients do walk-ins at the centers for socially displaced persons in San Fernando and Port of Spain. Those are the areas where they do walk-ins. Um, the, and the unit would also do referrals. The other facilities, they are care facilities, so that is subject to a referral, an assessment and a referral process. And the other facilities that the unit is directly responsible for in terms of persons who go there would be the New Horizon facility and the Hernandez Place facility. Those facilities, referral is directly through the unit. Other facilities that may be providing uh, care or other services to street dwellers and are receiving subvention would have to provide they provide data to the NGO unit and the unit in terms of uh, the number of persons that they would have seen and provided service to. With, uh, and they're only accountable for us for the subvention. In terms of persons being double counted, at uh, um, the nature of the population, persons would present our population may present more than once in any given period for admission at the centers for socially displaced persons. That's the nature of the population. But it is understood, and they would have, this is, you don't get a new file when you come in. It is this person, and it is not counted, per se, as a new person for the year. It would be counted as an admission, because in the end, you would have 30 admissions for the year, and know that 20 of those are new, and there are 10 that are repeat persons. And that's okay, because as the nature of the clientele, they will present at the centers, these first step centers, more than once in any given period. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I have uh, an interest with respect to two additional areas that I glean from your, your, your own submission. One, socially displaced women. I would like to know what intervention do you have specifically for women who are socially displaced, re their safety, their health needs, matters uh, they're peculiar to women? Do you have a specific program for women who are unfortunately homeless, living on the streets? In terms of our population, we do have um, women are not, not, it's not a high representation. So in terms of their care needs, homelessness, we have New Horizon responds to, um, we have female admissions, we have separate accommodations for the women at New Horizons. And uh, um, of course, in terms of whatever the issues are specific to women, those needs would be addressed by the care staff at the facility. Um, in the past, we would have had referrals of female substance abusers, and there is one facility specifically for female substance abusers that persons, women with substance abuse issues can be referred to. Thank you very much. And now I, I need to move internationally. You did indicate that you were looking at practices abroad. I understand there was an example from the Philippines. There was one from Los Angeles, the flexible housing subsidy pool. What I'd like to know is what have you learned from the experiences abroad that can be implemented in Trinidad and Tobago? Because I know there's something from Chile, from what I recall from Chile as well, yes. In direct experience would have been, and for me, 
as part of as a the director in the unit would have been in Miami and Chile. The other would have been through research. And uh, at Miami, the learning essentially was the need to have a coordinated and uh, integrated type of service for the clients. Of course, how is done in Miami, it would be done differently in Trinidad. And in my opinion, I think it's easier to do it in Trinidad because we have a public health service that is available for persons that they can walk in and access help. And that really does make a difference. In uh, Chile, what was very clear in Chile was the value for persons living on the streets as individuals with needs, with desires, with uh, ambition. It was very clear in Chile that these are persons that need help. To uh, This is a social problem that requires social intervention with support for some from other things where when you may have medical or legal issues. So in my experience, that would have been um, for Chile. Research overall indicates that this is, a, it is a challenge everywhere. The challenge for the mayor of um, he's always in the news, the mayor of in New York, in terms of what he is or isn't doing with homelessness. Los Angeles has a ridiculous, an entire, they have eight blocks of homeless persons on the streets. And uh, you always find that persons are very clear that they want something done and they want it done now. And the response from most people when you say you want to put it in their community is not here though. So it is not an easy problem to fix. It is not special to try and Tobago. The challenges internationally are similar to ours. Our population is uh, thankfully a lot smaller than what we have, than what I have seen internationally. There are some fantastic ideas such as housing first, which works really well in the rural areas in the United States because they have housing stock and they have areas that they can do the kind of housing that you need to be able to be able to give to persons, house them first, deal with their issues after. So it is a place that it works well, currently is being identified as best practice. It is an area that is informing in terms of how we think in, in the unit, what we might want to do, and how, where we might want to head towards. Very well. So, May I stop you? You raise a very important point. We have some, let us say, 500 people who are sleeping on the streets, let us say from your count. Do we have 500 beds currently available now in Trinidad? I, I'm not sure about what the arrangements with, with Tobago. So that if you were able to interview all of them, you were able to tell them, I have a bed for you to spend the night. Do we have that facility in existence now in Trinidad? The number of beds equal in the amount of people sleeping on the street? 414. No, we would not have 414. How much do we currently have? Because you, you see, your point is housing first. I think that mm -hmm. is the key that is going to open the door to solutions. If we can get them into accommodations so that they can, be, they can have a shower, they can sleep, they can get uh, a breakfast in the morning, basically a bed and breakfast, as it were, for people who are living on the streets. I've seen it done in Ottawa, for example. And they're out during the day, but in the night they have somewhere to sleep. If it is that we have 414, say, persons via your count, hence statistics happen to be important. How many beds would you say exist right now which uh, are available for housing? Right now at CSCP, we have uh, about 60 beds that are available. We have 60, and we may need about 500, it, give, or, give or take. So we are short basically 400 beds. And is it from your recommendation, because you are on the field, you're the social worker, you know what the needs are. Is it that these should be provided by the NGOs? the government, or any other form. From your experience as a social worker, what is the best mode of delivery for this critical need? Immediate shelter 
shelter arrangements are usually done. What I have seen is done managed by NGOs, but it is funded by state funding. Thank you very much. I think we are, we, we are making some progress with solutions. Then given, given your response, then could I really ask what is underpinning the PSIP figure of 3 million to 2,000 then, given that you don't have the allocation that you need? What is influencing that, uh, that budgeted request or amount? We're just going to provide some information on what we are planning to use that money for, one of which is a shelter, which will address some of the issues for our To go into much details, you could just tell me, like, how many beds would be available in that shelter, given the, the, the gap? We, we, are, we are approaching the time limitation, and the parliament normally is, is, is accommodating to me to move beyond 12.30, but I have committed that we will complete at 12.30. Could we pose our critical last set of questions now, obtain the responses from our, our, our invitees, and then we will wrap up? Yes. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, the shelter identified for, um, to be built under the PSIP funding has the process, the, pro the pro procurement process begun as yet? And do you intend to complete an award that at least award the contract by the end of fiscal 2018? Because um, we don't know that you're not using it, the money is allocated, you know? Yes, that is the intent. We hope to um, complete the whole procurement. But as I said, we will, in the process, still of trying to acquire the land and as, as well as with regards to Bessemer Street, now making steps to um, acquire the building. All right. That would just need to require renovations. Uh, none. One yeah. last short question. Promise me it's a short question, short. MP. <laughs> um, Ms. Rez Morrell indicated that you visited um, a facility in Miami. You also indicated that um, there were issues all over, but I, too, have um, visited a facility, I don't know if it's the same as you, the Chapman facility, which if anyone who travels to Miami would see that there are no uh, street dwellers on the streets because they have strict um, enforcement um, guidelines due to a strong unified uh, legislative agenda, which involves the businesses. Have you or the ministry considered adopting the Chapman facility to assist in this regard, seeing it is very successful. Yes or no? We are considering all the options. Thank you very much, Madam Permanent Secretary. It's now about time to wrap up. This has been a very informative session this morning. And I will ask the Permanent Secretary to offer us some closing comments before I close the proceedings. And also, the second permanent secretary, if she wishes to also offer some closing comments, I will invite her to so do. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Of course, the ministry remains committed, as we did indicate at the commencement of this session, to its role of coordinating the work of all the agencies to reduce the issue that we are speaking of this morning. We recognize that progress in some areas have not have been much slower than in other areas, such as in, with the legislation. But of course, we will be working with our, assiduously with our partners to change this and to improve the implementation and the advancement of what we have to do. Um, we trust that with the coordinating and monitoring committee coming on board in the next two months, our efforts would move forward exponentially and we'll be able to make a dent in this situation in over the next six months. Primarily, we will seek to address what is within our remit to address, which will include the staffing in the unit and also ensuring that that unit is resourced and making sure that the policy that we have reviewed is actually um, addressed by the other stakeholders and that we can get it to the Attorney General 
um, as soon as possible. Of course, the data collection, which came up here, is another issue. We are working on that system, and we trust that um, probably at the next session we'll be able to say that we have put a system in place that we are able to collect the data that we need so that our policy and programming could be improved significantly. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Madam Permanent Secretary. Perm P.S. Barrow, would you like to add your, oh, P.S. Barrow has, has not taken advantage of the opportunity to offer her closing remarks. But this morning's session, as I indicated, is a very informative one because what arose is that despite whatever successes we may achieve on the legislative front, there still is a deficit with respect to accommodating our socially displaced who happen to be sleeping on the streets and in the squares. And I think it is a matter of utmost priority that we now give thought to how we are going, as our the social worker, Ms. Borrell, indicated, to offer a place for the socially displaced to be accommodated at least during the night. And housing first, in my mind, will ensure that we make a great deal of progress in starting to arrest this problem. It is understood by the committee. It is accepted by the ministry that the socially displaced remain citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who are guaranteed all the protection under our laws and their treatment must, of course, be in compliance with the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. We do need to understand that we are dealing with fellow citizens who have special needs. One of them is to ensure that we have adequate accommodation. So we look forward to what the PSIP will, will, will contain with respect to accommodating the 400 individuals who have to sleep outdoors because no beds are available. And hopefully that number should be reduced. But we want to see what will happen between the ministry, the PSIP, and the NGOs on this critical matter. That, I think, was a very important statistic which arose towards the end of our proceedings. There is a need to regularize life coach positions so that those who are rehabilitated and reformed can at least obtain some employment within the state sector itself. We know that more social workers are needed, and we hope that the recruitment process will proceed apace. We have seen that the SDU, the Socially Displaced Unit, may not have as much implementation capability as is required, but we hope that you are going to work on the implementation capabilities so that this unit will at least be able to visit on the street. You see, this treatment of the socially displaced will occur by visits on the street. It cannot be confined to an office in the, in, the, in the towers. One has to go out, and in order for that, one needs the apparatus to make the street visits and to be able to negotiate with the persons on the street that they must take advantage of the opportunities offered by the state. We need timelines for, the action, for, for, for actions. Uh, the, you have given us the assurance that these timelines will be forwarded, certainly with respect to items under your control and with respect to items not under your control, we were advised that the SDU, Socially Displaced Unit, is in the process of coordinating all the various agencies, which would include the police, because we do need to look at the Summary Offenses Act as well for loitering. That is an important component. The Mental Health Act, the AG's Office, the Ministry of Health, and the Socially Displaced Persons Act. So a number, I understand the complexity, but there are a number of agencies which must be coordinated. Without proper coordination, nothing will get done in a timely fashion. And without proper implementation, the homeless will remain on the street. And without a number of beds available, we will not be able to accommodate. And if we don't address these issues, we will return a year from today, and we will not have made much progress in the problem. And what is the problem? We would like our socially displaced to be given a chance to become socially integrated. 
Uh, we, we discussed the need for private uh, partnerships that may have to be uh, a function of the SDU or maybe the social workers to coordinate with the private sector and, and, and an opening arises with respect to the private sector participating with the NGOs to provide auditing services at a reasonable price, but also to, to, to relate with the private sector so that they could offer employment as well for those who wish to be reintegrated and who should be reintegrated into society. We, we, we have looked at overall, therefore, the problems where there are silos and the problems of this particular issue falling within a range of ministries. I am of the hope that the SDU will be able to coordinate the various agencies. And so the task for the Ministry of Social Services is really to bring the partners together and to do what it can do immediately, quickly, and what it cannot do, expedite the legislative problems that we have with respect to the Mental Health Act and the proclamation of the Socially Displaced Persons Act, maybe even look at the Summary Offenses Act, but also we need critically to be looking at hardware. How are we going as a society to provide a bed for the 400 persons on a nightly basis who have to sleep on the streets because the state and the NGOs are currently not able to house them. This, I think, concludes this morning's hearings. I wish to thank all of our listeners and our viewers on the par Parliament channels. I wish to thank the members from the Ministry of Social Services. It has been very informative. I wish to thank my colleagues in the committee for pursuing this follow-up visit. And at this point in time, I bring the meeting to a close. Good afternoon, and thank you for your participation.